and then from there. Uh, Let's pause one sec here. time we've been sitting here, you know? Yeah. The official soundtrack of the downtown east side. I'm Garth Mullins. This is Crackdown. Episode 6, Room 821. Today's episode is about two crises we're facing here in Vancouver, and we've been left to deal with them pretty much on our own. The housing crisis and the overdose crisis. Some days, I'm hopeful that our movements can fix these things, that we can remake the world. But on other days, all the death and misery are just too much, and you want to give up. The truth is, I didn't really want to be a drug user activist. I used to aspire to a more boring life. Get up, drink my methadone, go to work, keep my head down. But I know that's never going to happen. For better or worse, these crises have changed me. I'm a different person now. I'm sure many of you can relate. It's only been a few years since this overdose crisis got started, but thousands of people have been totally transformed. And one of them is Jay. Hey Jay, can you introduce yourself? Um, my name is Jay Sloan White. Formerly an attendant at the Bell Memorial. Uh, I used to be IT, not anymore. Jay's in his 40s. I meet him at an empty parking lot on the downtown east side. He's drinking a mocha and wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt. He tells me and my producer Sam that he's not a big talker. I don't like to speak in front of people. Are, yeah. are we making you nervous doing this? No, this is not a group. All right. <laughs> Jay's not kidding. As we talk, I get the impression he doesn't want to riff or bullshit too much. He likes getting to the point. Jay's always done the jobs other people don't want to do. He used to work in IT, and he's the kind of friend you can bring your computer problems to. And on a couple of occasions, Jay helped people in more extraordinary ways too. Like the time he saw a drowning woman. Well, it's not much of a story, just uh, there was a couple of people between me and her, but they didn't do anything. So I had to run out and then swim out and get her. And I'm crisis capable, I guess, so I don't stress out too much. This story starts in 2013. Jay's on methadone and it's working pretty well for him. He's living with his adoptive parents in the suburbs. Not exactly a dream scenario in your 40s. And to make matters worse, Jay's methadone clinic takes hours to get to by bus. And so unless he wants to be dope sick, he's got to make that trip every single day. The commute was killing me. Well, what did you used to do on the bus? Uh, play games on my phone. What games did you play? Golf Clash, great game. Do you, have, do you have the golf game on your phone now? Yeah. There's a couple of free goodies at the beginning, but I'll just go right into a match here. Jay would sit at the back of the bus while he played the game and just let the world kind of drift by. Just trying to occupy time, occupy yourself. At that point, it was just mostly dealing with the addiction and working. That's all there was. Perfect shot. That was perfect. Jay likes to fix things, but at this point in his life, he's not doing a lot of that. He's just trying to get by. So he decides he's going to move to Vancouver, closer to the methadone clinic, and that way he won't have to spend all that time on the bus. The only places he can afford are single room occupancies, or SROs, on the downtown east side. The first place he tries is called the Regent, and as Jay walks in, the man behind the desk looks him up and down. The guy's like, are you sure you want to live here? Uh -huh. You might not want to. Have you seen the place? I guess I was too normal, not street enough. And he said, no, you, you can probably get a place at the Balmoral. The guy at the region called up and said, yeah, there's rooms. Give this guy a room, so they give me a room. So you got to know someone to get a room at the Balmoral, apparently. Yeah, I guess so. At this point, Jay doesn't know much about where he's headed, but I do. I've lived in places like this. And my best friend used to live at the Balmoral. We'd hang out in his room and do speed balls. The Balmoral originally had upscale ambitions. It's built over this once grand pub, but I only ever knew it as a dive. Inside, the walls are the color of nicotine. 
When you walk in the door, the guy behind the desk gives you the hairy eye right away. Think bouncer, not concierge. The elevator is often busted, so you're taking the stairs. Jay walks up to room 821, the number stenciled on in spray paint, and he opens the door. What did it look like when you first got in? It was a mattress on the floor. So, short story. The walls were like a old-time plaster kind of thing. Rat holes that I had to battle with. Material-wise, absolutely, definitely the shittiest pl- place I ever lived. Jay decides to fix up his little 10 by 10 room. In a situation like this, I always start with the rats. Apparently, they're pretty determined when they want to get in. Everything I, I put there, they would get through it. Did you ever solve the problem? Yes. How'd you do it? Check this out. There's a rat in my room. And he's scurrying around. I can't get him. Jay looks around his place and he sees a toy house. Picture a little box with windows painted on it. And a door. Except for this door has actual hinges. So he takes the little house and nails it to the wall. Covering up the hole the rat got through. I opened the little door. And sure enough, the rat took the exit and closed the door. And that was it. A lot of time spent fixing up my room, a lot. I raised the bed like uh, four feet off the, three and a half feet off the floor and used my speakers to post it up there and um, use that for storage, which is an essential in an SRO. I had a big screen TV in there and my computer. When I was done, it was the best looking room in there. There's a, a sort of a family or a community type environment that happens, develops between people there. I mean, there's some bad apples, but there's a lot of good apples too. And uh, wasn't there somebody there, was this person on the second floor made uh, roast beef sandwiches? Yes, yes, I know who you're talking about. I can't remember her name right now. And what was the deal with that? How did you get a roast beef sandwich off her? What, like a couple bucks or something? Yeah, she, yeah, she would come around and hawk her roast beef sandwiches. What other kind of, uh, like it was an, its own contained economy in some ways, right? Like, what other kind of things were like that? Well, if you needed drugs, you didn't have to leave the building. There's that. There's, there was a few people that were like facilitators. If you wanted anything, you need a chair, this guy will get you the chair. He'll go around to every unit that he knows. Buddy up there is looking for a chair and give me a couple of bucks. Or whatever the case may be, right? Pretty soon, word spreads about Jay's computer skills. People start to bring him their busted phones and laptops. I bet you wish your apartment had an IT guy and a roast beef sandwich lady. But there were other kinds of problems in the Balmoral that never got solved. Many residents' doors were broken, and some people didn't have doors at all. On top of that, each floor had shared bathrooms that didn't always work. And there was lots of black mold everywhere. The tenants would complain about this stuff, but for the most part, nothing got done. In fact, Jay learned, if you live in an SRO, it's best not to complain at all. You know, they're really considered the the housing of last resort. This is Ryan McNeil, Crackdown Science Advisor. During Jay's first year at the Balmoral, Ryan was looking into homelessness in Vancouver. You know, Garth, you'll remember this. There was a tent city that popped up in Oppenheimer Park in the downtown east side that year. And a lot of folks in the park are folks who've been evicted. There's a way evictions are supposed to happen. If you want to evict somebody, you basically have to serve them with sufficient notice. Oh yeah, there's a process. I mean, I've had those notices stuck to my door. There's a paperwork, there's a bureaucracy, there's rules to it. Yeah, and this basic contract about how we're supposed to operate housing just seems not to apply in the downtown east side. We had people getting insufficient notice, scrambling to try to find a place to live, We had people outright being kicked out. Then we had the more nefarious shit happening, like people being threatened. It's like a necessary evil, really. Slumlords are sleazy, but where do you live if you can't afford to live anywhere else? Uh, My name is Wendy Peterson, and I'm a longtime downtown Eastside resident and community organizer. Wendy Peterson has red hair and shitloads of energy. She lives near the Balmoral, and she's a veteran anti-gentrification activist. I got to know her in the lead-up to the 2010 Olympics. She was spending a lot of time in SROs. I had been 
uh, infiltrated the region to the Balmoral Hotel for a year and a half and was running a campaign with tenants. How did you infiltrate? Um, I would just go in and, and often I never asked permission. I would mm -hmm. ask forgiveness. And when they finally say to me, what the hell are you doing here? I'd say, oh, I, I'm just like, I'm a social worker. I'm right. helping people. And once in a while to um, reinforce my identity, I would bring in a fridge or a mattress <laughs> for somebody just and I made myself some fake um, tags around to hang around my neck. <laughs> can, can you show us those tags? Uh, like I don't know made, if I have any any fake social worker tags. Yes, I, did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Didn't understand it at first. I still really don't. She doesn't live in an SRL. Her kids live in the neighborhood. I mean, wouldn't it make it better for her if uh, they closed down all the SROs? But Jay keeps hearing more and more about Wendy, that she's organizing with tenants, that she wants to stand up to the city and to the landlords, and that she needs someone on the inside to help. One of Jay's friends tells him, I've already recommended you for the job. Which is to be a advocate or a tenant organizer, a force against the slum lords, and all that they represent. I mean, the cause is definitely good. Uh, for me, the damage it might cause me, I was definitely nervous about it. What specifically were you nervous about? Getting kicked out. You it's a rough town to find a place. Um, at first, I didn't follow through with it, and then they actually went around looking for people and gave out a pamphlet. It was $200 a month, so it like almost doubled my income. So that was a factor. I said, yeah, yeah, I can do this. Give it a shot and we'll see what happens. I can always quit, right? That's when things changed. So Jay tells Wendy, I'm in. But you know, he's not super eager. The truth is, Wendy's also a little worried. Before she met Jay, Wendy had tried to organize with tenants in another SRO, not the Balmoral. The plan was to force the landlords to improve the hotel. It was when we uh, made our first tepid complaints to the city, when that's when the blowback and the backlash started. So did they try to evict people that they knew who were working with you? Um, it was more than evict, Garth. Well, tell us what, what, like, what was the backlash? Well, okay, the, the worst example of backlash was one of our tenants getting his door knocked down with a shovel in the middle of the night while he was sleeping in his room. Um, eventually that little group of tenants said, okay, we're going to try a complaint. And when the landlords found out and figured out who it was connected to, who was asking for the basic repairs, um, the one who was the most vulnerable, uh, when she walked past the front desk out the door, one of them said to the other one at the desk, they said, hey, how, mu how much money do I have to pay? Or who can I pay around here to punch somebody out? And she knew that was for her. She knew it was tied to the complaint. Mm -hmm. And the whole group just went away. They were like, Wendy, we can't do this. And I'm like, I totally agree. We can't do this. I know tenants walk on a field of broken glass. So I'm not going to let you get your feet cut. But so it doesn't might mean that we can't just run right through the <laughs> field of broken glass. We've got to take little steps and figure it out. But I also tell people that we just don't give up. So Jay and Wendy get to work. They have a sheet of questions to ask tenants. The idea is to compile some data and then take it to the city inspectors and the residential tenancy branch. Maybe they can force the Balmoral's owners to improve the place. So they start making the rounds. Knocking door to door interviewing people or asking them what's going on. Hey, do you have mice? Do you have cockroaches? Do you have bed bugs? Have you ever asked your landlord for a repair? I see you don't have a door. Is that a problem for you? Uh, I knocked on the door of one memorable guy. He opened the door and I looked and right beside his bed there was a giant pile of garbage with a rat on it. And he's like the mice's the mices and then he showed me around the corner and I looked and I was like oh, oh my god and in the in his closet was another giant pile of garbage with like three or four big gray rats and they weren't scared of me those rats they were just like hey <laughs> how's it going <laughs> Wendy thought this guy needed more support 
not to be left on its own in the Balmoral. She asked a woman who worked for the city about the mice's guy. And she said, did you see his hands? And I said, no. And she said, the rats have been eating his hands. Oh, Jesus. Um, I know social workers don't want to go in those buildings. I know the fire department doesn't want to be in them. The police don't want to be in them because so, they're so disturbing. Like tenants get blamed for the conditions that they're living in, but it's this system that's keeping, that's not allowing them to ask for what they need and get what they need and get the help that they need. They could have threw some money at that and solved that problem. The rats and the bed bugs and all that, vermin. It's not like an impossible thing. It's not like something that can't be rectified. People shouldn't have to live in subhuman conditions. And that's exactly what it was, subhuman conditions. So how did we even get to this point in Vancouver? For decades, politicians have been cozying up to big developers and landlords here. They've stripped down regulations and ignored their crimes. And this has turned the city into a kind of wild west of speculation. Don't get me wrong, landlords are exploitative everywhere. But the ones that own these SROs seem cartoonishly villainous. So the city told me originally, they said, they're so nice, you should talk to them. <laughs> I'm like, you've got to be kidding. This is, the, this is the worst thing about Canadians, <laughs> i got to say, is that, is that so, you can do evil and then someone will say, but they're so nice, you know? The Balmoral is owned by the Sahotas, three siblings that live far away from the hood. As long as I can remember, they've been synonymous with slumlords in the city. The Sahotas got into the SRO game in the 1970s, and that was part of a much bigger plan. Buy up Vancouver's most distressed real estate assets for cheap. Soon the family owned properties across Greater Vancouver, including 500 low income rooms. Then they just waited for real estate prices to go up. They did, and the Sahotas buildings became worth more than 200 million. Over the years, the city of Vancouver gave the Sahotas hundreds of bylaw citations, but it never stepped in and forced them to make these buildings safe, dignified, or livable. All this to say, when a lawyer approached Jay and asked him if he'd be the lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit against both the city and the Sahotas, it was a kind of declaration of war. Not just against some of the most powerful people in the city, but against the logic of Vancouver itself, the way the city had worked for decades. We were going after them, one, for the squalor that they let exist, right? If you have to compare all these various things you're doing, like going around interviewing people in the building, um, being the lead plaintiff, is there one that you thought was the kind of most risky of them? Uh, the lawsuit, for sure. Like if there was going to be any backlash, it was going to be from that. Respond to emergency. Medical aid. And then it was 2016, and a long winter was coming. Fentanyl flooded the market, and the overdoses piled up. Ann Livingston and Sarah Blythe set up an overdose prevention site in a tent. And Laura and Al from the editorial board patrolled the alleys along with the Vancouver area network of drug users, saving people's lives out in the streets. But a lot of people were dying alone inside in their rooms. So, you know, when we think about SROs, these buildings are actually set up in ways that are horrible in the context of an overdose crisis because they function to isolate people. I mean, they're, they're all, like we were talking about, they're single room occupancy, right? So there's almost no common spaces. Yeah, everything with how these buildings are organized are set up to isolate people. In many cases, they might be living in a building that prohibits them from having guests. And the last thing we want in the middle of an overdose crisis driven by adulterated drugs is for people to be injecting alone. Which is exactly what people were doing in the Balmoral. Jay says that year was really rough. He remembers one day when a woman came up to the eighth floor. She asks, can anyone inject me? I can't do it myself. So I do. Next thing I know, she is not looking well. She's stiffened right up. She's on the bed and she just not breathing. What starts going through your head as you're watching that? What was it I'm supposed to do? <laughs> okay, definitely scream 911, someone call 911. So 
I'm like doing the TV CPR, pumping on her chest, giving her breath. Then, uh, oh yeah, it's Narcan, poke her with the Narcan. Also referred to as naloxone. The first time I saw it was back in the 1990s. I remember there's this guy lying on the sidewalk. Paramedics injected him with something. And the next minute, he was up and calmly smoking a cigarette. I thought, what the fuck? What the fuck did they just give him? And for a long time, drug users weren't allowed to have Narcan in Vancouver. But we found ways to get it anyway. In 2016, it was finally starting to become more available. And had you seen other people do this before? No. No. You know where to stick her with it? Yep. And where's that? Any muscle. Your arm or your leg or your butt. She starts to come to, just as the ambulance shows up. And Jay thinks, I just saved someone's life. That's pretty cool. And he decides to put a sign up on his door. I don't know where I got the tape. It wasn't fancy or flary. I had no bedazzler stuff. In all caps, he writes, Narcan here. And then below he puts, knock if someone's ODing, anytime. And then how long did you have the sign up for before you got your first knock? Probably three or four days. My neighbor comes banging at my door. Jay, Jay, help. She's dying. She's dying. Right? Total panic. But that was, she was in the room next to me, so not too far away. It was this older lady. She was out. She was going blue. She definitely ODing. So I was giving her CPR. One thing I remember her breath was awful. It was like, I don't know what was going on in her, in her lungs, but it was bad. So it took one hit, one ampule? No, it was four. Oh, you, you had to put four. So you go through a whole kit, then you get another kit, you unzip that, and you start working into that supply of Narcan. Yeah, yeah. Does that happen to you a lot? At that time, it was like a dozen times a week. You personally were responding a dozen times a week? Yeah, for the first two or three weeks. So a couple times a day. So you must have had a big stockpile of Narcan kits in your room. Yeah. It was hard for Jay to get enough Narcan at first. Sometimes people would knock on his door and he wouldn't have any. Those were not good days. But eventually a street nurse starts to make regular deliveries to him. Jay meticulously hangs the kits on his wall. Jay wanted people to come and pick up the Narcan from him. He wasn't looking to become the Balmoral's in-house paramedic. Uh, at first, nobody really had a clue on what to do when they're trying to resuscitate someone from an OD. Everyone's trying to pump on their chest like they watch on TV. You no, know, I've been uh, like a heroin user from way back. I did a lot of stupid things to try and resuscitate people over the years. Mm -hmm. I definitely have put people in the cold shower. I've like slapped people's face and yelled and like I've thought about, you know, this moment of panic happens and I'm like, okay, didn't someone say you, you like shoot people up with milk? No, that can't be right. And like <laughs> this one, uh, that I was told recently is like you make people smell their own shoe. Have you ever heard that? No, no, not that particular one. Jay reluctantly takes it upon himself to become the Balmoral's Narcan guy. At first, he's responding to a huge number of overdoses, 12 in a week. Eventually, Wendy gets one of her friends who's a street nurse to come to the Balmoral and hold a meeting. Over 20 people crammed into the hallway right outside of Jay's door. So people sat around with their fake kits and practiced stabbing oranges and listened to this nurse explain, you know, this new medicine that can reverse overdoses. And you know, sometimes these places can be chaotic and noisy. You could actually drop a pin as Sarah was giving the teaching. And then afterwards we said, Jay, here's the kits now train, train everybody. He's like, okay, I'm on it. Eventually, Jay even starts to get some attention in the local press. He's become known as the guy who's saving people's lives at the Balmoral. How were you feeling around that? Um, like there was a reason to get up. That was a noticeable factor. Before, it was like, there was no reason to get up. I don't have to get up. Sleep all day. So Jay has a few different jobs at this point. He's the Narcan guy, he's the tenant organizer, and he's the lead plaintiff. He didn't know it yet, but he and Wendy were about to get help from an unexpected place, from a kind of a spy. Hello. This is Sam Dharmapala. Originally from Sri Lanka, Sam worked for the Sahotas for over nine years. 
Yes, I was the bookkeeping guy there for the, all the properties and also maintenance work. I mean, kind of hiring and firing people, <laughs> that kind of work. Sam was completely fed up with his employers. So we told Wendy there was a water line leaking in the basement of the Balmoral. The water had spread along the floor and pooled under one of the wooden beams holding up the bar. The beam had decayed and hollowed out. And right above the beam, it looked like the dance floor was starting to droop. He was worried that the Balmoral was going to collapse. And he had seen a building on TV in India collapse, a factory. And he was like, that's what's going to happen here. So I compiled all of this evidence and I sent it to the city and I got no response. Three days later, Sam started to get some alarming messages from his co-workers. He didn't know what to do, so he sent them all to Wendy. Picture, uh, sending pictures, sending messages, sending emails. Sam texts me and he said, you need to get the police, you need to get the city here right away because Goody and Paul, the owners, are in the basement and they're fixing the beams with their staff and their staff were tenants who lived upstairs who were heavily under the influence of drugs all the time. I, so I phoned the city and I said, i got to talk to an inspector. Hurry, hurry. I get to an inspector, and I'm like, well, what do I do? And the inspector said, well, I guess if you're really worried, you can call 911. And so that's what Wendy does. And she says soon the authorities showed up at the Balmoral. And they caught them (laughs) red-handed in the basement. That's when we figured, okay, this this is bad. The city's engineer said that the building was unsafe. Not just unsafe. The engineers say, unless a professional contractor fixed up the basement, there was a pretty good chance the Balmoral's mezzanine would collapse. And if anyone was in the pub when that happened, they could die. After that, the pub was closed. I remember this. It was a scary time. Because we all knew that hotel was built right on top of the bar. We thought, is it even safe to be in this building? A few months later, there was a rumor going around that the city would kick everyone out. Approximately 150 people just suddenly homeless. We weren't sure if it was going to happen, but we knew if it did, it would be a disaster. Ryan, so around this time, you were doing a study with people who had recently been evicted. Yeah, so, I mean, the study was sad. We're interviewing people, we're trying to get them back a few months later, and there were people we couldn't find. And, you know, that's always a struggle with a study. Um, But this was different because for some of these folks, you know, we'd hear through our networks, you know, they'd tell us that, well, yeah, no, we can't find that person because they're dead now. And, you know, nothing lays out the life and death stakes of someone being evicted amidst an overdose crisis. Like the the sad fact of not being able to find somebody <laughs> to participate in a follow up interview because they're dead. So did you find out what was going on? One of the big things that we'd have people talk to us about is they'd be evicted, night times hitting. You know, I gotta stay awake. I gotta guard my stuff. I gotta keep safe. You know, that included being safe from police. And so all of a sudden, even if they hadn't really used before they're starting to use meth just to stay awake just to stay awake yeah you know there's only so long you can stay awake and be okay basically people's life just goes to hell on top of that when people get evicted they often lose track of their dealer they got to scramble to find a new supply for people at the balmoral getting evicted would also mean not being able to knock on jay's door when something went wrong those tenants at the Balmoral, they knew that if they ended up on the street, they'd be dead. They would rather stay in their shitty building with the rats eating their hands, the beams in the basement that were threatening to collapse. They knew they had a better chance in there than they did on the street. On June 1st, 2017, the city of Vancouver duct tapes an order to vacate on the front of the Balmoral. The city says, quote, residents had to be evacuated from imminent danger. They say they'll relocate people. But Wendy hears the plan is to just move people to shelters. And I went to their office and we met and I basically cried and I made them cry because I'm like, is this really what it's coming down to? Like that, that you have no place for these people to go? 
There's this little old lady, and her room was so full of stuff. She lived here 20 years, she was content. She put it on me pretty hard. Did people really think of you that way? The guy that got everybody kicked out? Yeah, yeah. It, it was on me. Um, I was scared too, I had no place to live either, right? But so I had the same stresses, so I, I definitely know where, where they were coming from. Okay, then the action starts. We've got 12 days to evacuation day. And you start having meetings on the eighth floor, right? Uh, I, every night at eight o'clock at eight, we called it eight o'clock on the eighth. Everybody in the building met on the eighth floor. And this is not like a, a lovely, like a common room like we have here. This is a hallway, right? A hallway. So everyone sits down Everybody each side of the hallway. And sitting on milk crates and sitting on the floor and grabbing their chairs out of their rooms for other people. And we have this big, long hallway full of packed, angry, upset, really um, tense, stressed people. Wendy, Jay, and the tenants occupied the mayor's office. They say they're not going to leave until the city promises that no one's going to be homeless and that everyone can move with their pets, partners, and possessions. Then the tenants and activists shut down Hastings, the major street running in front of the Balmoral. They set up a stage and hold a block party. Thank you. I would like to ask um, Jay at the Balmoral. He's one of the tenants here. Jay, would you like to come and um, speak? I get up and talk to everybody. Hated that very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming here today. Um, just wanted to say a few thank yous. A special thank you to Michael and Sarah from the Community Pizzeria for their generous donation. Jay shuffles his feet nervously, and then he starts to walk off the stage. You're supposed to be up here with me. Get up here. Speak in the Speak up, Jay. We need to keep this spirit alive for the other buildings that are going to face the same thing. Yeah. The other people. We had this rip roaring public international fight. We told Vancouver and the world what was going on. The fight over Vancouver's most notorious SRO has officially become a street protest movement. This didn't need to happen. They could have been here 10 years ago. Uh, doing the repairs themselves. We just got media after media after media after media. There was just so much public pressure. And all of this pressure, it worked. Wendy says an NGO found a building at the last minute and almost everyone could move there. The public pressure accomplished something else as well. The Sohotas were forced to come down to the Balmoral and pay everyone a settlement. So the city set up the, the, the pub entrance and they, um, they had the Sohotas sitting at a table with their checkbook and there was a lineup down the street of tenants there to get their checks before they left. All, this, is, this is the procession of payments. People in line are waiting for the other shoe to drop. There's no way the Sohotas are actually going to pay up. First guy comes back, checks are good! <laughs> Everybody <laughs> Lots of, hey, good job, man, good job. Oh, everyone's loving me that day. It was a good day, yeah, for sure. Last summer, the city of Vancouver tried to force the Sohotas to sell them the Regent and the Balmoral. But so far, they refused. Today, both buildings stand empty, boarded up, and derelict. The class action lawsuit against the Sohotas failed as well. After repeated calls, I finally got a hold of Paul Sohota. I told him who I was and that I had questions about the Balmoral. And then he hung up on me. Jay now lives in a new place on the downtown east side. The building has a nice courtyard, and he's got his own bathroom and kitchen. It's a much better situation. Jay says there's no Narcan sign on the door, but people know they can knock, and he'll be there to help. That's a pretty nice ending for most shows, but I'm not going to leave it there. Jay saved people at the Balmoral, no doubt, but that's just one story in a city full of stories like that.
A woman named Barb did the same thing at the region across the street from the Balmoral. She also had a sign that said she had naloxone there. In the face of all this neglect, people across the city took it upon themselves to save their friends and their families and their neighbors because the government sure the hell wasn't doing it. There's even an organization now called Toro, Tenant Overdose Response Organizers. So you're here at the Blue Vault. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm just going to drop off some supplies to my friend. Oh, don't let them in. <laughs> this is Samantha Pranto from Toro. She coordinates a network of 24 tenants in 12 buildings across the neighborhood. Awesome. Thank you. Sam makes sure they're always well stocked with supplies. Hey Robert, Sam from Toro. How's it going? I'd give you a hug, but you're too far away. Uh, so I brought you a bunch of bubbles by. There's 10 in there. Five stem kits. There you go. I'm the man, eh? Yeah, you're the middleman today. I'm putting you to work. Yeah. And then we've also got uh, five of the IV packs. For me, this is what the story is really all about. People organizing to do things that the government won't. We need to get organizations like Taro into far more buildings, and it's going to take more than Narcan. The overdose crisis and the housing crisis are inseparable. Jay and Wendy knew that all along. If we want to stop the overdose crisis, we're going to need to expropriate slumlords SROs. We're going to need real social housing. And we're going to need an end to the systematic exploitation of renters that has spelled so much poverty, misery, and death for so many. Housing is harm reduction. Crackdown is produced on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. The last couple of days have been hard. Two people overdosed at our listening party yesterday. But because we're all trained with Narcan, like Jay, they're okay. But this dope was really bad. It's fentanyl mixed with benzodiazepines. This is a dangerous combination. Be careful out there. One of the people who overdosed is the partner of an editorial board member. He was taken to hospital and is now recovering at home. Get better soon, man. We love you. Crackdown is now a harm reduction site. That means we can train our guests and anyone on the team in how to do this, how to reverse overdoses and make sure people get to stay alive. We also can give them naloxone kits. Great shot. And I have some good news. Crackdown just won silver at the New York Festival's International Radio Awards. That's the Olympics of radio. Great shot. Well done, everybody. Nice on. Crackdown is produced by Alex Kim, Sam Fenn, Lisa Hale, Polly Legier, and Gordon Kaddick. Production help from Alex DeBoer and Sharon Nadim. Consulting from Sam Pronto and Jay Sloan White. Glenn Mofford, author of Along the ENN, The Historical Tales of Vancouver Island, gave us some Balmoral history. Our science advisor is Ryan McDean, lead of the qualitative and community-based research program of the BC Centre on Substance Use. Ryan is also assistant professor for the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. I'm Garth Mullins, host, writer, and executive producer. You can follow me on Twitter, at Garth Mullins. Original score written and performed by Sam Fenn, Jacob Dryden, Kai Paulson, James Ash, and me. Our theme song was written by me and Sam with accompaniment from Dave Jens and Ben Appenheimer. We get funds from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And also from our Patreon supporters. Thank you. If you like what we do, support us at patreon.com slash crackdownpod. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you can get podcasts. Subscribe, rate, and review. It helps. We're also on CITR and Co-op Radio in Vancouver, and now on CFUR in Prince George. 
We're happy to be on your radio station, too. Follow us on Twitter at CrackdownPod. Our website is CrackdownPod.com. Our next episode drops at the end of July. Be safe and keep six for each other. Hmm? How does it sound? Sounds awesome. Nice, right? I'm glad we set it up. You have been listening to a Sided Media production. C I D E D. Find out more at SidedMedia.ca.